So um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual seminar series on Gaussian processes, spatiotemporal modeling, and decision-making systems. And uh, we're really excited to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we just had an issue with the YouTube sound, so that's fixed. I'm sorry about this. Um, back to the announcement. Uh, my name is Alex Trennan, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Cambridge and one of the organizers who's going to be hosting today's event. And I'd like to thank my fellow organizers, Jeff Pleiss, uh, Lisa Simonova, and Zi Wang for their work in helping to put this series together. And before we begin, I'd like to just make a few organizational announcements. So first off, uh, following this seminar, we've got an amazing set of speakers lined up in the coming weeks. And you can find the schedule on our website, which is gp-seminar-series.github.io. And yeah, check it out. Uh, you can join the seminars via Zoom as long as you register to receive emails with the links, which can be done on the website. Or you can join on YouTube, which doesn't require registration. Uh, seminars typically take place at 1600 UTC, which is coordinated universal time. And uh, be aware that your local time zone may change due to daylight savings, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can use the raise your hand option to ask questions or type your questions into the chat. And the speaker can choose to either pause and answer questions during the talk or hold the questions to the end, depending on their preferences. And for one final announcement, um, I just would like to say that we are moving our mailing list uh, from MailChimp, which is the platform we used to use, to Google Groups, because MailChimp uh, doesn't allow us to have a mailing list as large as the one that we have because they changed their policy. And so if you are still subscribed on MailChimp, and uh, you'll know that you are because you received an email with like a picture at the top, then please uh, resubscribe to the Google group, which is uh, linked on our website. If you just go to their registration page, it'll kind of tell you how to do that. That way you don't miss the links in the next few weeks. And uh, with that said, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jake Gardner, of the University of Pennsylvania, where he is a professor, who will give today's uh, seminar, uh, the title of which is Scalable Deep Bayesian Optimization Over Structured Inputs. Uh, Jake, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Let me go ahead and turn all of the relevant things on and share my screen. Uh, okay. Before I jump in, can I just confirm really quickly that you can see my slides? Confirming. Okay, great. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, I am going to talk about some work that we've been doing that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, before we jump into it, I want to apologize a little bit for, and I've put it in scare quotes at the end here because I'm backtracking a little bit of putting putting the word deep in front of Bayesian optimization because I don't know I don't know if that's something that we needed to have happen, um, but as you'll see, we really are training uh, <laughs> very large transformer models on very large data sets as the first step of some of these optimization problems. Um, so I, I think the title may be warranted in this case, um, but I, I guess we'll see. Uh, so let me start by talking about a couple of problems that uh, I've recently become really interested in, in solving that I think sort of motivate um, some of these ideas. So to begin with, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we might cast um, uh, drug design as an optimization problem. So this is something that has been coming up in, in the base op literature in the past couple of years. And, and the idea is, um, you know, I might have some something like this protein here. So the, the, the blue curly looking thing, if you're not familiar with these, these are proteins. Um, many living organisms make these and they're essential to uh, all, if not, you know, most, if not all life on earth. And this is particular protein is something that is uh, essential to the life cycle of the hepatitis C virus. And so here in this blue region, we have uh, this sort of green and blue and red looking scaffolded molecule that is docked to this protein. So it's gotten very close and it's energetically favorable for this molecule to be there. 
Uh, and this interferes with the function of this protein. So this protein is essential for the life cycle of the hepatitis C virus. This molecule interferes with this protein, and therefore this molecule is an antiviral. Um, so designing these kind of small molecules or even antibodies that interact with interesting proteins can lead to new therapeutics like antivirals, antibiotics, and even uh, potentially anti-cancer drugs. You know, there are um, certain proteins that appear on the surface of cancer cells more often than uh, on normal cells. And so you might represent this molecule uh, as a string. So here I've actually written down something called the smile string representation of this molecule. Um, this is just a way of representing both the atoms that make up this molecule and the graph structure that makes up the connectivity, the bonds between the atoms in this molecule. Um, you know, this isn't necessarily the best string representation, but it's it's definitely one of the most common. And you might think about how we could design strings like this that would interact with uh, molecules like this hepatitis C virus molecule uh, protein. Uh, another thing that we've been thinking about a little more recently um, is how we can use these kind of string or structured optimization problems to interact with some of these very large generative models that have become uh, really, really well known over the past year or two. So here is an example where we've uh, entered a picture of a mountain as a prompt to this model called stable diffusion, which if you're not familiar with it, hopefully you're familiar with at least Dolly and stable diffusion is a a relatively similar model model and and you know stable diffusion has faithfully output a a picture of a mountain um and here is a is a result where uh, it turns out by prepending the string turbo left check uh the the check mark is a unicard unicode symbol for a check mark to a picture of a mountain the model will always uh create images of dogs instead of of mountains um so this is sort of like a adversarial prompt design for for these these uh, these generative tasks, and you know, in the same way that I think uh, adversarial images taught us a lot about neural networks, um, the idea is maybe we can we can learn something about how, what exactly these generative models are doing when given different prompts by by creating these kind of things. So in this talk, you know, as the the title, including Bayesian optimization, alluded to, we're going to try and formulate this as an optimization problem. And the idea is I maybe have some discrete set X uh, that I want to search over. And this is maybe the set of all possible organic molecules that I could feasibly make. So there are vast data sets of molecules that we think we could make. There's this, the famously the zinc uh, data set, I think we're up to zinc 20 now, which has literally billions of molecules that you could plausibly manufacture in a lab. Uh, and even that is only a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the space of all possible organic molecules we probably could manufacture in a lab if we set our minds to it. Um, and we might define some function F, and F might take in a molecule from this set and measure something like the docking affinity of a molecule X to, say, a protein that's necessary for the life cycle of hepatitis C. Now, obviously, the, the best possible thing would be if we could measure this in a lab, you know, just literally go into a wet lab and make these molecules and measure the docking affinity. Um, but we can't always do that, you know, especially in 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 the kinds of papers we're writing in machine learning venues. So we're sort of relegated to using uh, docking software, which sort of does a physics simulation, right? It takes the protein and it takes the molecule and it it tries to bump them into each other and see if there's a sort of energetically favorable configuration where the molecule is close to the protein. Um, and it, you know, the idea is it returns a sort of affinity, like how how well does this molecule interact with this protein? And the goal, of course, is to maximize the function f, right? So we'd like to search over all possible organic molecules for molecules that maximize docking affinity. Now, I want to say at the outset here, um, I have this little green asterisk here that so far I have mentioned nothing about is the molecule that we're going to find safe, right? You know, a, an antiviral or antibiotic is not very useful if when we give it to a person, it's toxic to the person, right? Uh, is it specific, right? Uh, it's also not very useful if my molecule binds to this, you know, protein that I want it to bind to, but it also binds to like 15 other proteins um, that might cause side effects or, or even worse. Um, there's also no notion here of synthesizability necessarily, right? So just because I can like write down the graph structure of a molecule doesn't mean it's cheap or even possible to make in a laboratory. And that's going to be a, a big problem that I'll touch on a little later. 
And then there's also stability. So as many of you may know, the uh, the mRNA vaccines for, for COVID, for example, had to be kept at very, very low temperatures. Um, and so, you know, these, these molecules, just because they, they may have uh, some activity you want, um, it, it's not necessarily the case that they're stable at human blood temperature, for example, if you, if you wanted to give them to a person. Um, so, I, you know, I, I want to say at the get, the get go that I, I'm aware that just viewing this as an optimization problem over docking affinity has problems. And in fact, I'm going to explicitly touch on those problems later in the talk. Um, you know, and 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 where there are still problems with this, even if we can solve these optimization problems. Um, so just bear with me for a little bit. Uh, I, I promise you, we will end this talk on a low note for for this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, approach. So the way we're going to approach this problem, you know, this is a this is a, a fairly challenging optimization problem on its face, right? This is a it's a it's a discrete optimization problem. Molecules are discrete objects of the atoms and bonds that make them up. Um, and, and discrete optimization problems are fairly challenging, especially when the search space is is, is so gigantic. Um, but there's an idea that people have had recently. It, it's not my idea, but I think it's a really good one that's appeared in the base op literature relatively recently. Um, is you know, let's first learn a generative model over molecules. So this is a lot easier to do than it is to find higher binding affinity molecules because you know, to learn generative models, all I need are examples of molecules that I could plausibly make. I need to know what molecules look like. And we've gotten really, you know, pretty good at generative modeling, especially for the kind of data that can be represented as, as structured strings uh, in the past couple of years, right? You know, if you've ever opened chat GPT or, or some of these, these models, they, they, I mean, they have their problems, but, but we've gotten reasonably good at training these kind of models. And what this allows us to do by training this generative model is it gives us a latent space that is real valued, right? So, um, you know, in particular, we're going to be looking at VAEs in this, in this talk. And what a VAE does is it gives you a real valued latent space that I can move around in and then pass through my decoder or you know my generator, whatever my generator is, and that generates my molecules, right? So the idea is instead of searching over molecules directly, let's search over just the set of molecules that my generative model could possibly generate. And I lose stuff by doing that. You know, one of the obvious things I lose is if my generator can't generate every single organic molecule out there, then obviously I'll never be able to generate anything it couldn't generate. Um, but you know, what it gains me is I've now reduced a discrete optimization problem to a continuous optimization problem. And, um, you know, if I have a really large set of organic molecules to train the generator on, uh, maybe that's not so bad. Maybe I'll still be able to generate very large fractions of the set of organic molecules and sort of do the search over, over that space. So the high level approach, and I'm going to discuss both of these in detail is, We'll first learn a continuous latent variable model, a generative model for molecules. And then we'll use a continuous black box optimization algorithm like Bayesian optimization over the latent variables learned by that generative model. So what does this look like? Well, here's, you know, broadly speaking, what a VAE looks like, you know, at a, at a high level view, right? We take an input molecule X, we pass that input molecule, which we represent as a string, you know, for example, as a smile string, uh, through an encoder, right? And the encoder gives us an, you know, a latent vector Z. Really, it gives us an amortized posterior over latent vector Z, but that's actually not very important right now. It, it will become important later. Uh, and then what we can do is we can take the latent vector Z. So, you know, this this orange rectangular rectangle down at the bottom here is, is my real valued continuous latent space. And the molecule is this single point in that latent space. I pass that through my decoder and that outputs a string which represents a molecule. And the way this is trained, you know, we, of course, uh, we train it with the elbow, but really what you're, you're doing effectively is you're trying to reconstruct the original input model, molecule, right? So I, I input a molecule. And then what I want to have happen is when I, um, take my latent vector Z and decode it, I get the same molecule back. Um, and in general, the idea is you do this with millions of molecules. And what I now have is this latent space, this, this orange rectangle. The idea is you can move around this space. Um, and 
the idea is, you know, with, with the original molecule, you'd have to sort of come up with a notion of what it means to make a little epsilon change in the molecule, right? And, and you'd have to know a lot more chemistry to do that. Um, whereas in this latent space, I can just move epsilon away, right? I can just add epsilon to Z and decode that and see what happens. And hopefully, if my generative model was trained on enough molecules, uh, in order to do this kind of compression, it will have had to organize in such a way that epsilon changes are meaningful. Now, whether or not they do that, again, we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, but these models do get really large, and, and they're pretty good. So here, um, you know, this, this JTBAE is a, this junction tree variational autoencoder. Uh, was a paper that came out a couple of years ago that, that does pretty well in this. Um, here in this talk, we we created our own um, you know transformer encoder decoder model that you know this is where this sort of deep comes into the title. These these you know this model takes four days to train on a handful of A6000s. It's, it's a fairly you know computationally intensive process, um, but we can do pretty well um, you know in terms of in terms of if we just look at reconstruction accuracy for the entire molecule. And it's not so it's not so slow ultimately to decode, right? So it doesn't add a lot of overhead to the optimization process. It's still the case that most of the running time will be spent evaluating our physics simulator of trying to dock the molecule we get out to the protein. So this is our latent uh, our our latent variable model. This is our generative model, uh, and and it gives us this nice continuous latent space over Z. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll use continuous black box optimization over Z. So I'm going to touch very briefly on Bayesian optimization here, um, just to sort of, you know, if, if you haven't seen it before, it's it's not actually that complicated of an idea. And the idea is, you know, I have a function that I want to, to optimize. In this case, I'm going to minimize this function f of x. And here I've evaluated the function at three points. Um, and, you know, the, the general assumption here is that I can't do things like differentiate f with respect to x or afford necessarily to evaluate it everywhere in the input space. Um, so the idea is what we'll do is, well, I have these three evaluations. So what can I do in machine learning? I can fit a model. And in this particular case, we'll fit a Gaussian process, which uh, is, is really nice in the optimization context because it gives us both this mean estimate of the, of the function, and it also gives us this uncertainty estimate. And we can combine that mean and uncertainty estimate into a policy for uh, often called an acquisition function for where do we try to evaluate the function next. So here, maybe we decide to choose to evaluate the function next here because the lower confidence bound is relatively low here. So we're optimistic that we might get a really low function value there, which is good. Uh, and so then we evaluate the function. So I get this new point and it turns out it wasn't as good as the lower confidence bound said, but hey, at least I've acquired new data, right? So what can I do with new data? Well, I can now update my model and have an even better fit to the function, right? And so I can keep repeating this iterative process where I acquire new data, update my model, and then use that model to decide where to sample uh, until I found something that you know looks like a like a like a plausibly good uh, function evaluation. And you know it's not the case that the GP fits the function perfectly everywhere, but you know, up to its uncertainty estimate, it's doing a, a pretty good job here. It has a reasonable understanding of the function. And, you know, the idea is that by doing this process iteratively, we get better and better at producing new candidates that, that might improve our function value. Um, so this is Bayesopt. And the way we apply this in the, in the, in the most basic sort of uh, latent space optimization setting is we simply apply this algorithm over the latent space. So here, what I have down uh, in this in this rectangle is the same latent vectors that all correspond to molecules, but each one has been labeled with its score. So here, this is the docking affinity of the decoder applied to this latent vector, right? So I took this latent vector, decoded it to a molecule, ran my physics simulation, and got a value of 0.61. And we're just going to apply Bayesopt in this latent space. Right, so uh, you know, and the same logic applies ideally that uh, applied to any other optimization problem. So here, for example, I see I have uh, latent codes that got scores of 0 0.7, 0 0.61, 0 0.68, 0 0.62. It's probably much more interesting to sample in the middle of those points than to sample in the middle of these three points over here, where I have you know 0 0.12, 0 0.22, 0 0.04. Right, those are less promising points if my goal is to maximize docking affinity. 
right? Um, so I I just run Bayes up in this space, and uh, this does you know reasonably well. So so here is. Uh, results from a couple of papers that have done this in the past couple of years. Uh, again, this idea is pretty new, um, but but I think it's a I think it's overall a pretty good one. And what we're doing here is is actually a very simple optimization task. We're just effectively trying to make molecules that are as hydrophobic as possible. So penalized log p, log p measures the the hydrophobicity of a molecule, and it's penalized in a way to make it so that the molecule is what we call synthetically accessible. So we we want to design molecules that are not only hydrophobic, but that we could actually plausibly manufacture. Um, so here I'm, I'm showing results from a, a couple methods, including you know, standard latent space Bayesian optimization. So the, the basic framework I just mentioned is the, uh, the purple curve down here at the bottom, um, which even that is actually doing pretty well. So, so the dashed line at like 4.5 is Suppose I just measured log p for every molecule in the data set that my generator was trained on. Uh, what would be the best log p in that data set, right? So the fact that we're able to substantially exceed that in only 500 evaluations of log p means that we're able to generate um, relatively high scoring molecules better than any molecule that was would have been in our original data set we trained the generator on. Um, with, with with relatively few evaluations of log p. And I think this is really promising because it, it suggests that this kind of approach can be a viable alternative to virtual screening, where I just have a discrete library of molecules. I'm just trying to figure out which of that fixed set maybe um, maximizes this property. So um, things don't look necessarily as good if you try it on more challenging tasks. So here are two tasks from this benchmark uh, suite of drug design uh, problems called, called the guacamole benchmark suite. Here, we're running many, many more function evaluations, um, which is something we'll come back to. Notice that the x-axis here, um, you know, they, they go up to 80,000, 120,000 plus even. Um, and the y-axis really only gets us from like 0.52 to like, you know, 0.54. So every guacamole task, for reference, the score uh, is scaled between zero and one. So one is the best possible score you could theoretically achieve. Not all tasks that's necessarily even achievable, but that's just the way it's defined because they're like geometric means of certain properties. Um, and here we're getting like 0.5, you know, 0.54 on, on one of these. And here, actually, the best in the data set is like 0.8, right? So we actually may have been better off with a with a virtual screening approach on these these tasks, which are which are much more challenging, I think, than log p. Um, so we've been, you know, I, I became really taken by by this kind of base op, this sort of latent space idea, because it seems really cool to reduce. You know, if I can solve the generative modeling problem, maybe I can solve the optimization problem. Uh, and there were two sort of problems that we thought about um, that that maybe we could we could solve. And one is, you know, it, it sounds magical the way I've described it so far, right? I, you know, amazing. I can, as long as you have enough unsupervised data, I can turn a discrete optimization problem into a continuous one, uh, which is really cool. Um, but, you know, you don't get that for free. And, and one of the things that's really challenging here is that these latent spaces can be really high dimensional, right? So in order to be able to achieve this sort of compression and, and reliable generation, most of the VAEs people have been using, the lane spaces are often up to 256 dimensions, um, which, you know, if you've ever used Bayes up before, that's challenging, right? Um, you know, the, the vanilla Bayes up algorithms are often not very useful past, you know, a, a, a dozen or so dimensions, right? Um, so this, fortunately, I think, you know, we have a pretty good idea of maybe how to, how to start. Like, people have been working on high dimensional Bayes up for a while, right? So, you know, idea number one, why don't we just try applying high dimensional Bayes opt in these latent spaces, right? So, uh, you know, you know, let's not ignore the fact that what we've really done isn't convert a discrete optimization problem into an easy continuous optimization problem. We've converted a discrete optimization problem into a still pretty challenging optimization problem because it's high dimensional. Uh, and let's just try to, you know, solve that problem now. Um, so one approach we've been taking, um, this is work we did while at Uber, uh, is, is local Bayesian optimization. And the idea of local Bayesian optimization is, you know, if I have this two-dimensional function, the, the famous Brennan function, 
and I want to sort of distribute candidates all over the input space, then in two dimensions, I can do this reasonably well. So here's a handful of candidates and it reasonably well covers the space. But of course, you know, with the curse of dimensionality, as I add input dimensions, the same number of candidates becomes sparser and sparser and sparser. So let's just abandon the idea of doing global optimization entirely. And we'll do optimization entirely inside of a trust region. So what is a trust region? Well, a trust region has a center. It's some point in the input space. And it has a trust region length. So it's some, uh, some hypercube subset of the input space centered at some point. And what we'll do is we will um, sample our candidates from inside the trust region instead of everywhere in the input space. So here, the trust region actually spans a fairly large portion of the input space. But uh, this is actually kind of a misleading picture because you know, in like a 200 dimensional space, the trust region is really like 10 to the minus 100th, the size, the volume of the of the total input space, right? So these are very, very small boxes. And what we'll do is we'll do Bayes opt only inside this box, but we'll modify the box every once in a while. So there's fundamentally three operations we can do to modify the box. So if we're making good progress on optimization, and you know, we're, we're constantly updating and getting better function values, then maybe what we'll do is we'll grow the trust region. So if I'm making progress, maybe I maybe my model has a pretty good understanding of the function inside the trust region. So I'm willing to try a slightly larger area of the input space. And you know, maybe, maybe I can make progress more quickly by growing the trust region. On the other hand, if my model is failing to make progress, right? If I'm if I'm constantly suggesting points that just aren't improving my function value, then it's you know, it's pretty clear that maybe my model doesn't have a good understanding of of the objective function inside the input space. And so what we'll do is we'll shrink the trust region, right? So it's making the model's job easier, right? It's now only responsible for understanding the function inside a smaller region of the input space. And the last thing we can do is we can move the trust region. So say I evaluate a candidate and I actually do get a better objective value like this one here, we will recenter the trust region to now be centered on that point. And so the picture we want to have happen is now I make new candidates and keep doing this. And what we'd like this to look uh, like at the end is this sort of path where um, as optimization progresses, the trust region gets closer to an optimum because we're always centering it on the best point found so far. And it's probably shrinking overall uh, because as we get closer to the optimum and things get flatter, it becomes more challenging to uh, improve our function value. So it's you know more likely that by the end we'll have shrunk and now we're really just doing a, a very fine search just around where we hope the optimum is. So whether or not this is what's happening in 100 dimensions, who can say, right? But this is the sort of the, the, the like cartoon picture of, of what we might want to go on. Um, and you know, at the time, this worked pretty well. So we tried this on some 14 and 60D optimization problems on, uh, in, in RL. And it, it did pretty well compared to not just Bayesian optimization baselines, but but also uh, uh, some other opt black box optimization algorithms like CMAES um, that, that are pretty good at the time. Um, you know, I'm not going to go too much into these because we're really focused on the, the molecules optimization task here. But uh, you know, I, th I think it's a, a reasonable approach to high dimensional Bayes opt at least. Uh, and so you know, you could apply the same thing here, right, to this latent space optimization. So let's let's pop back to this. And the idea is, well, I have some latent vector Z, this, this orange point here. I can just draw a trust region around that inside the latent space and effectively directly apply uh, turbo, this, this trust region Bayesian optimization inside this latent space, uh, inside the trust region, inside the latent space, right? So a, sort of a local optimization, Bayes opt approach to, to uh, this latent space optimization. Um, now, there's one other problem that comes up when you try to do this, uh, which is the generative model that we trained, there's no real assurance we have that it's actually very good for this kind of optimization. So in particular, number one, we're using a trust region, which is saying, you know, I'm only going to search in very close to the best point I have so far. And number two, we're using a Gaussian process, which models are relatively smooth, you know, it's a relatively smooth function model. Um, the generative model, which was unsupervised, you know, it was a pre-trained thing that we we did and now we're doing optimization, doesn't really care. And so it's entirely plausible that I could take this very similar model, so molecule. So 
this molecule really only differs by this, this sodium uh, at the top of it. And, and so it's despite the fact that it's very similar, it might encode to a completely different part of the geometry, a part, different part of the latent space, right? So it, it might not actually appear inside the trust region. And so this would violate the assumptions of both the Gaussian process, right? It's, it's no, like these two points are very similar, and yet the, the kernel value between them might be very, very small, um, despite the fact that we should expect them to have very similar uh, objective function values. And it also violates the assumption of using a trust region in the first place, right? This green point, which is the point that's pretty close to or the orange one, but maybe a little better, is, is well outside the trust region. So uh, what we decided to do to, to try and solve this was, why don't we train the GP and the VAE jointly? So the idea here is, in, in, you know, um, well, well, at a low level, the idea is what we'll do is we'll just set up a joint variational inference problem for both the latent space of the of the the VAE and the inducing values of the GP, and we just write down an elbow for both models jointly. And the idea is I now have a an elbow that has an unsupervised component and a supervised component. So if you, if you do the derivation, which I'm not going to do here, you get a loss that looks pretty nice. You get a you get effectively the standard VAE loss that you were using already, and that's defined over all of the unsupervised data. And then I get sort of an expectation over the standard plain SVGP, the stochastic variational Gaussian process loss, where the expectation is over the encoder, right? So effectively, what I'm doing is taking the VAE loss and adding an SVGP loss. But the training locations for the GP are stochastic now. So each input to the GP is actually a sample from the uh, the amortized posterior of the VAE, right? And, and the idea is the encoder is now getting signal both from the data I have supervised signal for and from the unsupervised data for the, the VAE. Um, so... You know, in order for the encoder to make the GP do well at its supervised task, what it will need to do is move points that should have similar function values. In fact, we, you know, in this case, we've measured the function value, right? That's the supervised data uh, close together, right? That way the kernel value is, is no longer approximately zero, right? Um, and I think, you know, if, if you take away nothing else from this talk, I think this is probably the thing that's maybe the most interesting, which is... In standard Bayesopt, we're kind of stuck with the input space we're given, right? I, I have a function f of x, I want to optimize f of x, and the function looks like whatever it does in x, right? That could be non-smooth, it could have discontinuities, it could be gross, right? Here, we, we've made the input space up, right? Like z is a thing we imagined, right? It's not, it's not intrinsic to the physical world of molecules. And so... In some sense, what we have is control over the geometry, right? We can try to make the geometry of the latent space better for Bayesop. Um, you know, in, in this case, what we did was we said, well, um, you know, let's just make it useful for the, the surrogate model we're using, the Gaussian process. But, but actually, you know, this is actually maybe even an argument for using really smooth models like Gaussian processes for, as surrogate models here. Because if I use a really smooth model of the function in my latent space and I encourage the latent space to organize for that supervised model, then I'm effectively making this function smoother, right? I actually can do that in this case, right? The function will become less uh, non-smooth in Z. And we actually have some experiments in the paper where we, we evaluate this. Like after doing the supervised training, you can move further away from the molecule and get less of a change in the objective value um, than without doing this retraining. But, but I think there's a lot that you could do here that, that hasn't been looked at yet. So you know, for example, maybe you could try to make the, the latent vector Z decompose. So if the function uh, depended independently on the different latent variables, then all of a sudden I would have effectively additive structure, right? I could invent additive structure potentially, uh, which makes Bayesopt a lot easier. Um, you know, you there are there are ways to do Bayesopt and additive functions that you, you get only linear regret in the in the dimensionality instead of exponential. Um, and so I think there's a lot of lot to do here sort of. This is why I'm calling it kind of deep Bayesian optimization because I think it it pays to maybe think about the geometry of the of the generative model and how we can actually change the the deep learning model to to make the optimization more effective. Um, anyway, how does this do? Uh, so here is this penalized log p task I showed you earlier with the existing results and 
you know, um, previous state of the art with with using Bezop was getting up to log p's of like 25, which is great. This is much higher than the best in the data set. Um, if you apply both of the strategies I talked about, you use high dimensional Bezopt and you sort of reorganize the geometry of the latent space, we were finding log p scores of like 595, um, which I think is a, a fairly substantial improvement. Um, this has problems, which I'll get to at the end of the talk, um, chiefly with cheating this as an unconstrained optimization problem where now it's good enough at optimizing and actually exploit the uh, Oracle a little bit here. Um, but so, so, you know, you couldn't actually make the molecules we're finding here, but everyone else is treating it's like an unconstrained optimization problem. So we did too. Um, and I think it's a fairly substantial improvement. Uh, and on the guacamole test, you also get fairly substantial improvements. So now actually you are doing fairly significantly better than um, the, the best molecule you could find in the data set. Uh, and you're also doing better than the best uh, genetic algorithms approaches we've, we've seen to the guacamole data set, as well as the best reinforcement learning approaches um, that we've seen to this task. So, so you do quite well with a Bayes-Opt approach here. Um, and, and both of the, the ideas I talked about matter. So here I'm showing you a breakdown. So, so the pink curve is LALBO, we called it, late, local latent space Bayesian optimization. Um, the acronym maybe uh, preceded the, the, uh, the, the name. But you know, the idea here is uh, the, the pink curve is doing both things. We reorganize the geometry of the latent space using the semi-supervised approach. And we uh, uh, also do local optimization. And here, you know, pink versus uh, yellow is ye yellow is you don't reorganize the latent space. Uh, and all the way down here at gray, uh, the gray curve at the bottom is if you just do standard latent space base op. So you don't try to do it as a high dimensional base op and you don't try to reorganize the latent space. Um, and the same thing is true for the JTBA as well. So green versus blue is don't reorganize the latent space. You drop to blue. And then blue versus the sort of, uh, I don't know what to call that color, like meh, mauve, purple, uh, is is uh, don't do high dimensional base off. So it makes a, a fairly substantial difference. Um, OK, so I want to talk about a second way we've thought about scaling these kind of uh, molecule optimization problems. And one of the challenges that we kept having when we actually talked to biochemists um, about, you know, we're working with them and we're, we're designing molecules in silico on a computer. Um, and we're saying, okay, you know, does this look promising? Would you try this in a lab? And the, the, you know, even before they make the molecule, they can often tell us like, oh, this is no good for this reason. And it keeps coming, you know, the reason keeps changing every time we try this. And so we got really annoyed by the fact that we kept running Bayesopt for for you know multiple days in this case to get one solution um, that that ended up not working, and we had to keep adding constraints and so on. Um, so one thing we thought about was, can we just find a hundred molecules all at once that all optimize the objective but are different from each other in a meaningful way? So the idea is I still want to maximize this function f with this asterisk that we'll come back to in a minute. Um, but I want to find m solutions now that are all pairwise diverse. So x1 star will just be whatever the best solution I can find is. But x2 star will be the best solution I can find. That's at least some measure tau diverse from the first solution. So delta here is a semantically meaningful metric of diversity, something like a fingerprint similarity, which might measure what functional groups do the molecules have in common. So X2 is like, I want to also maximize F, but it needs to have a fingerprint similarity or a fingerprint, I guess, dissimilarity that is at most tau, right? X3 is, I want to also maximize the function but the fingerprint dissimilarity from X1 should be at least tau and the fingerprint similarity from X2 should be at least tau all the way up to XM, which is optimize the function, but you need to be uh, at least tau fingerprint dissimilar from every molecule I found before. Um, so one way you could do this is sequentially find X1 and then X2 with that constraint and then X3 with a second constraint and so on. Um, but we thought a little bit about whether you could find these all at once. Uh, and the way we did this was was very simple. Um, we just, instead of, you know, say I want to find three uh, optimum, I'm just going to initialize three trust regions and distribute my budget between them evenly. 
Um, and what we'll do is we'll just constrain the tr trust regions the same way that the uh, optimizers will, would constrain. So TR1 was is, is responsible for finding X1 star, which was unconstrained. TR2 is responsible for finding X2 star, which was only constrained by X1 star. And so it'll be constrained by TR1. And then TR3 is constrained by both of the previous trust regions because it's responsible for finding X star 3. And all we do is we just um, propose candidates in order. So we'll, we'll evaluate batches of candidates, one per trust region. Trust region one proposes a candidate, and it can propose anywhere inside the trust region. And what this does is it induces this weird shaped uh, you know, set where uh, points are too similar to that candidate, right? So it's weird shapes because remember, we're not measuring diversity using input space distance. We're measuring it using fingerprint similarity in the final molecule, which wouldn't, it might not even necessarily be contiguous in the latent space. Um, you know, the second trust region might propose a point outside of that region, right? And then we'll, we'll you know, that'll again induce this region where, uh, uh, the diversity is too low with respect to uh, X hat TR2. And then we'll have this third point. Uh, you know, here we don't care about the region because TR3 is the last trust region in the list. Um, so nothing is constrained by it. It's only constrained by other things. Um, and what you can do with, a, with a, a, a bit of clever bookkeeping basically is as long as you run these trust regions in lockstep and are careful about how you recenter, you can ensure that the uh, incumbents, the centers of all trust region, form a feasible set, right? They are at least, you know, feasible for the optimization problem. Um, and then I just keep making progress and the, the feasible set as a whole gets better and better uh, as you run. So here, what we're trying to do is solve one of these guacamole uh, molecule optimization tasks. Um, where we're, you know, I've, I'm showing three plots here. Here we're trying to find five molecules, 50 molecules, and 100 molecules. And uh, what I think is most interesting here is uh, if you look at like I've drawn, I've drawn dashed lines, vertical uh, lines at 100,000 function evaluations, um, and it really doesn't take us that much longer to find 50 molecules that all score around like 0.98 as it does to find five. Right. So, so you actually don't lose a huge amount of function evaluation budget, despite the fact that, you know, for the 50 molecules, um, you know, you getting one tenth the evaluation budget for each molecule, because each trust region now only gets, you know, uh, instead of having five trust regions, each one proposing a candidate each time, I now have 50, each one proposing a candidate each time. So your function evaluation count is going up pretty quickly. And even 100 molecules were able to find... Um, molecules that do reasonably well by 200,000. So like a factor of two. Um, and, and we feel pretty good about the diversity metric here. So what we did to set the threshold was we just took random pairs of molecules in the data set. Um, and we said, you know, all of the molecules we find need to be pairwise at least as diverse as random molecules in the data set, according to this fingerprint similarity score. Um, and we do compare to the idea that the blue curve here is if you just found X1 star and then, you know, kept all that data, you don't want to like throw away all your data and then solve a brand new optimization problem, but you, you keep all that data and then search for X2 star, keep all that data, then search for X3 star and, and so on, um, which doesn't actually do that badly if you're trying to find five molecules. But when you're trying to find 50 or 100, it helps a lot to sort of uh, let the trust regions collaborate a little bit. Um, so here... We're sort of evaluating uh, how much do we lose in terms of optimization efficiency over finding just one molecule. So the gray curve in the in the middle of this uh, in the middle of this blob of curves is let's just run LALBO, which is this latent space optimization technique I told you about in the first half of the talk. Um, and you know, th so this is like the the best we were able to do finding one molecule. And even though we're trying to find 50 molecules with the blue curve here, um, it's not that much slower in terms of the convergence of just the best first molecule, right? So trying to find 50 molecules really doesn't lose you that much efficiency in terms of trying to find uh, 50, but you know it, it's um, but you do get sort of 50 molecules that are all pretty dissimilar uh, at the end as a byproduct. Um, okay. So I promised I would end on a little bit of a low note. So let's talk about the problems with everything I just talked about and why we're still pretty far, even if we 
you know, thought that this was the best optimization method ever, uh, which I don't think is true. Um, uh, I think the biggest problem here is that it's really easy to fool these oracles. So here's the molecule we found for optimizing penalized log P that gets the score of like 595, right? Uh, it's just a bunch of phosphorus ions all bonded to each other. This actually is cut off. There's like 700 of these ions all uh, bonded together. And if you, you know, the reason this happened is because I don't think people were expecting you to be able to find molecules with, uh, with scores, you know, much larger than order of tens. So, so penalized log P actually does penalize you if the synthetic accessibility is, is high. Uh, sorry, sorry. SA score is, uh, is a number that scales from one to 10, 10 meaning there's no way you could make this molecule, right? It's like completely implausible that you could ever manufacture this thing. We get a score of 10, you know, 10 out of 10, impossible to make this. Um, and the problem is if you just like subtract that from log P, it's like, well, okay, my log P is like 605. My penalized log P is 595. That's still pretty good. Um, right. Whereas if you're getting scores of like 20, then maybe subtracting 10 would actually keep you somewhere sane potentially. Um, so, you know, in, in fairness, we treated this as an unconstrained optimization problem uh, because that's what had been done. Uh, and so you end up with this kind of nonsense. Uh, this is actually probably the easier of the problems I'm gonna talk about to solve. All you have to do is just constrain it, right? So if you if you uh, constrain the synthetic accessibility score to be at most uh, five, right? So that it's you know one to five, meaning it's like reasonably plausibly manufacturable, you get synthetic accessibility scores of, of you know, sorry, you get uh, log P scores of like 45, which are still pretty high, but now they look like standard, you know, boring hydrocarbons that you could maybe make, right? Um, this thing here. Um, so, so you know, in, in, in many cases, the way you can get around this is, uh, is you can constrain the optimization problem to, to do something sensible, but that can't always be easy. Um, so, you know, here's another example where this gets becomes becomes challenging. And one thing we're trying to do is not just design small molecules, but design antibodies, which are uh, proteins that also try to bind to proteins. So, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 virus has this spike protein uh, that it uses to get into your cells. And if you bind enough antibodies to those spike proteins, then it kind of acts like bumper cars, right? Because the spike proteins are now bound to the antibodies, so they can't bind to the ACE2 receptors on your lung cells. Um, so, you know, this is a small portion of an antibody you might be interested in optimizing. And it's again, a string, it's a string of amino acids that we can chain together and then fold. Um, and it, you know, this is, it doesn't matter if you understand at all what this string here is, right? This is the string that represents this particular uh, portion of the antibody. What matters is you can immediately tell that if you do an unconstrained optimization, you get complete garbage, right? Like this string looks nothing like the string I just showed you despite the fact that we're getting scores of like 182 uh, for docking affinity, where like molecules that actually dock have scores of like five to six, like that would be a really high score, right? So we're, we are, we have found some way to exploit the behavior of the physics simulator. Um, and, you know, in some sense, we shouldn't even trust the score because like, in order to do this physics simulation, you actually have to fold the antibody. So we use alpha fold. Um, and it's very unlikely that alpha fold is correctly folding this piece of spaghetti, right? I mean, fold is a very loose word for what this thing will do anyways. Um, but like, surely the computational folding models will be very inaccurate for this kind of uh, nonsense. So really what we've invented here is adversarial drug design, right? We've, we've found a way to successfully exploit weaknesses in physics simulators that try to do this. Um, so one thing you might say is, well, let's not try to design completely new antibodies. Let's take existing antibodies and just try to increase their binding affinity a little bit, right? So maybe I maybe I take an existing antibody and I say, you know, let's try not to make more than like one to 10 mutations to that antibody. We'll, we'll change it mildly. Um, that actually causes problems too, but in, in more subtle ways. So here on the left, what I'm showing you is this green antigen, which is the thing the antibody wants to dock to. It's, it's, we're trying to design the blue protein to get close to the green thing. And we know that the antibody binds here. So, so the, the picture on the left, we know to be correct. People have done x-ray crystallography and 
you can actually physically look at these two things in complex, and we know that this is what they look like. Uh, on the right here, if you uh, optimize a little bit, it turns out you can get the antibody to have a much higher binding affinity, but to the wrong side of the antigen, right? It binds to the wrong side of the protein here. So if you imagine there's like a cell membrane in the middle of the green protein, like how would the blue antibody even get to that side? Like, like it's just not useful to bind over there. Um, and this actually, this actually happens quite a bit, right? So you, you can pretty consistently design uh, small modifications to antibodies that fairly impressively improve the binding affinity while keeping some like plausible looking structure, but suddenly cause the antibody to bind to a completely wrong, you know, it, it's, it's, it's nonsense, but for a different reason. It's not spaghetti, but it, you know, it's not, it's not binding to the correct thing anymore. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to do here, both on the, the optimization side of things and, and understanding how we can make better geometries of generative models. But even, even beyond that, there's also this sort of, uh, Specter that if you if you want to use these things in practice, um, if you show this right uh, image to a, to a biochemist, it turns out that they don't get very excited about that. Um, so you know, I think there's you know a, a lot to do on on both ends here. But I I'm I'm pretty interested in the problem anyway, uh, and that's pretty much all I have. So thank you all. So I wanted to say thank you very much, uh, Jake, for an amazing talk. Uh, I'm really excited to hear about these ideas. And so we will now uh, open up to the audience for questions. Um, and I just want to note um, sort of about the format um, that if you want to ask a question, you could use the raise your hand feature that Zoom has, or you could type uh, into the chat. And uh, uh, at some point, we will uh, turn the YouTube live stream off to sort of allow anybody who's uh, not comfortable asking questions during the live stream to sort of ask their questions. And we'll maybe give a minute or two for that. Um, so is there anybody who would like to do so? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so in the absence of questions, I guess we're uh, going to go ahead and move to conclude the live stream. So before I do that, uh, I want to just thank uh, Jake for the wonderful uh, talk today again, and thank uh, say just say a thank you to all of our listeners on YouTube for joining us. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a question. Actually, there's two of them. There is, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to pause then and uh, allow uh, Cheng Kun Lee to ask the question. So let me find you so you can unmute yourself. So Cheng Kun, I've... Uh... Hi, could you help me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the Bayesian optimization in high dimensional space. So I'd like to ask, like, it's like in the latent space, we usually we have like 256 dimension. So do you have any modifications to the GP or SVGP or, or we can just use it like as usual, like except for training, like you use a joint uh, elbow or something? Oh, so we got it. Yeah. For, for me, it's like GP works for like less than 20 dimensions or 10 dimensions. Um, so, all we do here to handle the high dimensional case is we apply the stress region basing optimization. So, we're still applying standard variational Gaussian processes um, inside these trust regions. But by virtue of using this trust region, we're, we're you know, at any given step, we're only going to be considering candidates in a, a very, very small volume around the current incumbent and sort of make okay. iterative progress as we go. So, um, yeah, GPs aren't, you know, you know, kernel methods in general, right? Because these, you know, how many spheres can you fit into a 256 dimensional space aren't very good at these kind of high dimensional spaces. But the, the, the volume of these trust regions are often like 
literally 10 to the minus 100th the volume of the entire search space um okay and so so you can you can handle the full dimensionality with that um i okay. i think it'd be you know there are other strategies for high dimensional base opt you know additive structure was one i mentioned people are also looking on i i think like um linear dimensionality reduction is probably less likely to be successful here because you're already doing dimensionality reduction via the encoder so like why not just encode to a lower dimensional space if you can and it turns out you can't really go much lower than 256 before you start losing uh, generative performance. But certainly things like additive structure, like local Bayesian optimization, um, a lot of these ideas, um, uh, or, or like uh, like some of these ensemble of additive structures, right, might be really good things to try here if you can organize the latent space in such a way that, that the, the structure matches that assumption. Okay, yeah, thanks. And also for, uh, if we use GP life in such high dimensional space, we also have a lot of hyperparameters, right? For the land scales. Oh, that would be true. Uh, here we actually just use, so a couple of things. So one, we just use like, uh, you, you can actually just get away with uh, spherical. And part of the reason is like your input space is, is already made up, right? You already have 4 million parameters in the encoder that are giving you your latent space. So like if I'm training with a supervised loss, Right. Any any work I would need to do to make to account for non-sphericalness or whatever, a lot of that can just be accomplished by the encoder directly. Right. The encoder is like a you know six to eight layer transformer encoder, gigantic model. Um, so uh, the like yeah. the, the right. one hyperparameter or two of the GP is like, well, great, I have eight million plus two parameters that I'm training instead of instead of eight million. Um but yeah, I, I think we you can rely a, pretty heavily on the encoder in this case to do to okay. do a lot of the work there. In fact, I, okay. I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that you want as simple as possible a supervised model here, um, because that encourages the encoder to make the function smoother. Right, your function as a function of z depends on what the encoder is spitting out as you know where it's putting points, uh, and, and the smoother I have a function like you know a GP for example. Um, the the smoother your function will end up being potentially uh, as a result of the encoder doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And so, you know, smoother functions are just easier to optimize in general, I think. Okay, so so uh, just uh, if I understand correctly, so, I, so you are still using like a ARD kernel as usual or like? Probably yeah, yeah. Know. I mean, you know, yeah. we, we I, we've tried a whole bunch of things, spherical ARD. I think we even tried some two layer deep kernels. Um, and it, it, that helps. It depends. It's really problem dependent, um, okay. like which of these, you know, guacamole versus log P, um, for example, any of the guacamole tasks. But um, in general, the encoder does a lot of the heavy lifting there. So in the interest Thanks. of just uh, allowing yeah. <laughs> the other people to also ask yeah. a question, uh, yeah. there was, oh, I see the question by Sichiro Nishimori was uh, almost the same question that was asked. Uh, so I think uh, we still have uh, a raised hand by uh, Slava Berovitsky. So I'm going to allow you to unmute. There's also two questions in uh, Slack chat that we can get to after this. But why don't we take the... Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, Jacob. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so I wanted to ask... Um, um, about genetic algorithms. So uh, <laughs> I know very little, but OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just noticed that in one of the examples, you had a lot of um, target function evaluations, like tens or hundreds of thousands. And I was just generally thinking that uh, this kind of this number of evaluations is more of uh, genetic algorithm domain, uh, and you can achieve quite a lot with them because, well, they are hungry for uh, target function evaluations, but they can also do good things concerning like discrete problems like this molecular stuff. So uh, yeah, I wanted to ask like the, whether or not you thought about comparing to some genetic algorithm benchmarks here, and what are your thoughts about like, Will this work well, or the Bayesian optimization still will 
will perform much better here for some reason? Yeah, so uh, the shortest answer is we do compare to genetic algorithms. So here on this slide, uh, I, I, I very briefly glossed over this. GraphGA is the best performing genetic algorithms approach on the Guacamole leaderboard. So Guacamole maintains a leaderboard of like papers that are trying to optimize their scores. Uh, and we're comparing to both that and some methods from reinforcement learning, which are also fairly function evaluation hungry. Uh, and we do, uh, I think, a fair bit better. So, you know, uh, GraphGA is the red curve here. We're in pink. Um, and I think <laughs> I'm going to inject a little bit of my personal bias about scalable GPs here. I think a big part of why people didn't want to use Bayesopt for high function evaluations was less because, oh, Bayesopt suddenly stops working in that regime. And more because like, like when I started, you know, work on Bayesopt back in like 2013 or 14 or whatever, the idea of training GPs on like 120,000 data points in a, in a reasonable amount of time was a fantasy, especially because, you know, for Bayesopt, I need to not just train on 120,000, I then need to train on 120,001 and then 120,002 or whatever my batch size is, right? I need to train a lot of GPs on a lot of data. Um, I think that's less of an issue nowadays, like uh, good approximate GP methods on GPUs. You know, the, the training of the GP is really not um, so prohibitive anymore. And so I think it's still now interesting to ask the question, like, can we now compare Bayesopt to GAs in settings where GAs are considered very good? Uh, and we do this here, and it, and it seems to work pretty well. Uh, and we do the same thing, actually, even just the the, the results for Turbo. Um, here we're comparing to CMAES, right, which is this um, this mm -hmm. uh, evolutionary strategy uh, as well. And and again, we're we're doing pretty well uh, in that regime. So I, I think I think there is still room for Bayesopt in the, yeah, in yeah, the okay. high function but, but evaluation. Also, interestingly, it's your like closest competitor in this, in this uh, graph. Yeah, so, so th that I think is also true. I think, I think genetic algorithms uh, can be uh, pretty good. And the same thing was also true, by the way, on these guacamole tasks. So here, uh, graph GA was the second best method, right, mm -hmm. um, that, that we tried. So I, you know, <laughs> my... my <laughs> Some many people I know who work on Bayesopt or who work on machine learning have have strong biases against genetic algorithms. I do think they can work if you if you design them well for the task you're trying to solve. But I do think that like the the surrogate model optimization approach can work pretty well too uh, in in these kind of regimes. Um, in reality, our hope is ultimately to solve these problems in many fewer than 120,000 evaluations. It's just like you know. It's like my granddad said, if you want to solve an optimization problem in 100 evaluations, you better be able to solve it in 100,000 first. He didn't actually say that, but like, I, I, you know, I think, I think these are really hard optimization problems in their own right, regardless of the function evaluation objective at first, or the objective budget at first. They're just hard problems. Um, yeah, okay, okay. That answers my question. Thank you very much. So uh, we have some questions from George D. F who I'm going to try to ask to unmute. And if you'd prefer not to read those out, just let us know in the chat and um, I can say them for you. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and read out the questions on George's behalf. Uh, thank you for letting me know that. Uh, and uh, the chat says, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, do you think you could have induced a similar structure in the latent space via something similar to contrastive learning instead of including the GP, uh, although I guess it might not smooth things out as well. And two, how do you deal with the constraints on the molecules? I wonder if there was a way to encode the constraints into the latent space. And uh, I'm just reading this out so that our YouTube listeners can also kind of uh, listen along. So Jake, uh, take it away. Yeah, so uh, for the first question, potentially, so I think the the Grosnet et al. paper here, the TLBO, they are using a, a kind of triplet loss to try and smooth things out a little bit in the latent space. Um, so I, you know, I think there are other ways you could do this. Ultimately, the way, the reason we went with this joint training procedure is because our thought was like, how do we want the latent space to reorganize? Well, we want the latent space to 
be as good as possible for the supervised performance of the surrogate model. So sort of why not just train the, you know, effectively what we're doing here is treating the encoder as a gigantic deep kernel for the Gaussian process, right? That's really what's happening here. Um, and so in order for that to happen, the encoder needs to extract features that not only allow the decoder to reconstruct well, but also allow the GP to get good supervised performance. I, you know, like I said, I think, I, I, I think, um, you, yeah, you can auto diff all the way through and, and why not? We just close our eyes and auto diff. Um, I, I think this is probably the place where there is the biggest potential to do much better than what we, I showed you here today, right? Because I, I think the idea, I mean, the, the whole idea of, of latent space base opt is, is relatively new. And I think it's really important to sort of look at, you know, how do we, how do we get a, a generative model that doesn't just have a, um, a, a latent space or, or a geometry that's good for generating, but is also good for optimizing over the possible outputs of the generator. Uh, and I think this is also one of the reasons why we're using VAEs, because with the encoder, we can control that a little bit more. If you were using like a, a GPT style model for just generating text, it'd be a lot harder to control what the geometry of the of the inputs look like. Um, and so, you know, I haven't seen a lot of work using VAEs in natural language processing because there wasn't a lot of application for that necessarily. Uh, but, but here, I think it actually makes total sense to train these kind of gigantic transformer VAEs specifically um, and, and, and figure out how to make them good for optimization, basically. Um, so I guess to the second question, how you deal with the constraints of the molecules? Yeah, so uh, so, all, so far, all we've done is we've just applied uh, out of the box constrained Bayesian optimization techniques. So here, um, David Erickson, the, the first author on the Tarpo paper a while back with Matthias wrote this uh, SCBO paper that sort of did like a constrained version of, of Turbo. And, and we just swapped Turbo out for SCBO. I think it's a really good question. Um, you know, here, and even when we're doing like LALBO, we're only trying to encourage supervised performance specifically for the, uh, for the GP over the objective. We weren't even trying to encourage supervised performance for the GPs over the black box constraints. Um, just because, you know, we, we didn't, you know, I, I think in the LALBO paper, we don't do any constrained optimization tasks. It's only, it's only when we started working with like actual biologists that we started needing to add constraints to get things they wanted. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential to sort of ask the question, like, what does constrained Bayes-Opt look like in this setting? Um, but in, in general, I think there's a, a room to ask the question, like, what does, you know, look at the last decade of Bayes-Opt uh, research in general, in multitask base op, multi fidelity, base, like what does any of that look like when you have this generator in, in the picture? And can I take existing base op strategies um, and modify the generator in such a way that those existing strategies now work much better in this setting? Um, there's a whole host of, of questions that are unanswered there, I think. Right. So I want to say thank you very much, Jake, for the thoughts on this. Um, so I'm going to, with this said, I'm going to go ahead and conclude the YouTube live stream. Um, and before that, I want to thank all of our listeners on YouTube for joining us today and uh, remind that there is uh, another seminar coming up next week. So please sign up for the mailing list and you can find the instructions for that on our website, which is gp-seminar-series.github.io. And uh, as a reminder, again, uh, we are moving to a different provider for our mailing list, which is now managed by Google Groups. And so if anybody has uh, uh, missed the announcement at the start and and got the MailChimp email and would like to continue receiving emails, uh, please check out the website to make sure you are subscribed to the Google group. And with that said,